Welcome to our speaker series event featuring offensive coordinator of the Buffalo Bills, Brian Dayballs, presented by M&T Bank. Brian, thanks for coming on with us. I know you guys are busy at this time of year. I know things are crazy. You just, you're just you a day out of a heartbreaking loss to the Arizona Cardinals. Um, how's your – I mean, you guys just kind of bounced back. What time did you get back this morning? Uh, I got home at about 2.45, around there. So, uh, yeah, it was a quick turnaround. Yeah, it is a quick turnaround. What time did you guys show up at the office this morning? I know you guys get in early. Yeah, I was here at 6.37, somewhere around there. Yeah, go home, take a quick nap, and get yep. back on it. Yeah. I want to. I want to. I. just want to start right off. What. What a season so far. It's been so much fun for the Bills. It's an ex, ex, a, such a successful offensive season. It's got to be exciting to be seven and three, even after yesterday's you know one in a million shot to beat you. Uh, it's a good record headed into the bye week. Uh, I, I want to ask you about your quarterback, Josh. I mean, everybody talks about him. It's been a pleasant surprise. And really, you know, I, I, I'm on the radio every day. We talk about Josh every day. And even in our most wildest aspirations, we didn't think he would be able to continue the success and ha- take such a big leap forward and make it real. I mean, it's, it is who he is now. What, uh, it, was that a surprise for you or just a kind of a, maybe a, an expectation that was fulfilled? Yeah, I think Steve, he's, you know, he's improved since he's got here. Um, you know, he came from Wyoming, wasn't highly recruited, came in with a, what I'd say a chip on his shoulder and very eager to, you know, to improve every day. Um, you know, he's done that since he's been here. He's, you know, we've tried to tailor an offense um, specifically towards what he does well, his strengths. Um, and I think that he has a very good grasp of, of what we do. Um, you know he's been a he's been a pleasure to work with. Uh, I have all the confidence in the world in him, um, and we just gotta we gotta keep getting better uh, every day. And that's his mantra, and uh, I'm glad we have him. Yeah, and he, he shows up, and he is raw. He's right out of of Wyoming, and you. I mean, he's like this big, you know, ball of clay that you guys got to form into a starting NFL quarterback. And I mean, what's the first thing you do? Uh, for a guy like Josh, certainly he played a little quicker than you guys thought he might have to, uh, and you kind of had to do some things on the fly, maybe out of order. But what do you think was job one with Josh when he walked into the door of the facility for the first time as a number one draft pick? Yeah, I think that, that there was a, you know, everybody uh, has a piece in his development in, in this building. Um, he, he's such a bright young man, uh, very respectful to the people in the organization. And, you know, just teaching him, you know, what it, what it means to be a pro quarterback, the daily ins and the daily outs. Um, you know, when we went to Wyoming and he came here to visit, you, you got a sense of how smart this guy was, uh, not just on the wonder lick, but he could really grasp information that you were, you were quizzing him on in, in the process. And then when he got here, you know, you, you teach the system that you have in place, but you have to do things that your players do well. And you have to get to know your players, particularly the quarterback position. So this is, you know, this has been, you know, our third year together. We tweak things, you know, week to week, but we tweak them in the off season and have really good communication. And it's, it's my job to, to make sure we put a system that he feels most comfortable with to, that he can go out there, operate quickly. Um, and then we added some good pieces uh, around here, you know, credit to Brandon and his staff with, with obviously Cole and, and uh, John smoke, two years ago. And then, you know, Diggs this year has really helped with addition to some of the other uh, rookies. Yeah. And you, you had, you came to Buffalo. you I mean, you grew up here in Buffalo. Um, you've been around the national football league. What's it been like for you to come back coach in the hometown where you grew up? I mean, I mean, I know coaches, it's a nomadic life. I mean, yeah. staff get fired and you hope you get working it and you, and you move around and it's, you know, you kind of pitch your tent almost it's got to be gratifying to come back to Buffalo and have the kind of success you're having right now. Yeah. You know, it's a place that, you know, my wife is from here as well. Um, and, and, you know, I have grandparents that, that raised me that, that live here and, and some aunts and uncles that I'm very, very close with. Um, you know, it's good to, to be around family. It's, it's, you know, you're very fortunate to, to come back to, to your hometown. And we, we've had a home here for a while, even though I was at different places, um, this has always been our home. Um, you know, we love what Buffalo's about and, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it's been everything you can imagine being, being back in your hometown. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, 
I, uh, you, you did, you, you've coached around the National Football League. You've also been, uh, you've worked under coach Nick Saban at Alabama sure. for the 2017 season. You were play caller there for them. Uh, what's, what's the biggest adjustment you had to make going from a, you know, a, a college, even as big a program as Alabama is coming from there and then coming up and calling plays at the, at this level, uh, what was the biggest adjustment you had to make? Sure. Well, it was more of an adjustment when I went there, um, in the first place, I was, you know, in, in the national football league upwards of 17 years and uh, had an opportunity to go work for Nick, uh, you know, I worked for him when I was a graduate assistant back in 98, 99 at Michigan State. Uh, you know, it was good to to be able to get back with him. And, you know, he always runs a strong program, has great sound values and uh, foundation principles that he believes in. Um, you know, you work with these young kids and you, know, you get a feel for things that they have to deal with on a daily basis. And, you know, we're not, you know, these rookies aren't far removed from, from being where those guys were. So, uh, you know, teaching them, simplifying some things to help them learn quicker. Um, you know, the RPO game and, and the game, those were all valuable experiences that, that I had. Yeah, and, and you've experienced a lot of things at both levels. And now, I mean, you just went through with the rest of the whole country and the whole planet through a pandemic and what an off season it was and how unusual it was. What was the biggest challenge getting an NFL team ready to come out and get off to the fast start you guys did offensively, at least, you know, how, I mean, tell us about the challenges of going through sure. the pandemic off season. Yeah. You know, it, this business to me is about relationships and, and you have to form a, a strong foundation of, of trust with one another. And, and those are, you know, those are some of the missing ingredients that you have when you're, you know, you're going through OTAs. It's yeah. It's about the plays and, and some of the installation things that people can kind of, listen to and run over again. But to me, it's the, the daily interaction and the personal relationship that you can develop that will you know, help you when things aren't going your way. Um, so the, the Zoom meetings obviously are well, thankful for, to have those, but you know, the in-person meetings and the, uh, you know, just the day-to-day -day activity that you do with those guys, you know, those were some of the things that, that we certainly missed. Yeah, and you talk about the energy and the, and the interpersonal connection you have with your players. The fans can't inter have interpersonal contact with the fans e with the players yeah. either. The players are out there, and I've done the games from the Bills Stadium uh, when a home game's there and when an away game is there, and there's not much difference. Uh, it is an eerie different season uh, now that there's no fans. What kind of energy and what do you what kind of what has become the norm for you guys on your sideline about dealing with fans and with no fans? Um, at home and away. Yeah, we really got to, we really have to focus on bringing our own energy to the game and that, you know, we have certain guys that, uh, that you know, they, they feed off other people that have high energy and high emotion. And, um, you know, it's, it is, it is quite different. There's no question about it. We certainly miss Bill's mafia and, and the home field advantage that, that presents itself when people have to come here. Um, it's really just staying focused in on the moment and, and the players and the coaches that are down there on the field have to really supply our own energy. Yeah, we got a, We have actually uh, in a, uh, some Bills fans uh, affiliated with M and T that want to ask you a couple of questions, and I'm going to okay. invite Tony on uh, to come on and ask one. Tony Borwick, um, he's got a question um, for you about. Um, let's see, I think it's about you know about the transformation of the offense. We've seen it happen right before our eyes. Tony, you have a question for Brian Dayball. Go ahead. Hi, Tony. Hey, uh, Coach. Thank you for doing. Standing job with the more aggressive big ball initiative, They're averaging 27 points a game. Games averaging better than 32 points a game versus last year was less than 20. I'm wondering if there's one or two things to attribute this transformation to. In the second part of it, curious if you know the lack of crowd noise. Um, and with quarterback not being able to audible more freely at the line, but it's historically now higher scores. Did you get that, Brian? I got, I got I, some of it. Um, I think he has. He sorry, asked Tony, you about chopped up the, just a little bit. I'll tell you, is he asked you about the transformation of the offense this year versus last year? You were less than twenty points a game last year. And now you're uh, almost, you know, scoring 30 on a regular basis. And then he asked you also about, you know, Josh and his ability to 
audible in an empty stadium and on both sides, I guess for both teams, offense and defense, how much easier it is to communicate on the field. So talk about the transformation of the offense and how much better they score and maybe some things you attribute that to and then talk about how easy it is to communicate on the field. Yeah, I think, think, Tony, that's a good question. You know, we've, we've, this is our third year together um, in terms of Josh and myself. And and again, you know, what we try to do here is, is build and, a system that is is right for our players, particularly our quarterback, and, and helping his development in any ways we can. And you know, adding the pieces, you know, like Steph, um, you know, and Beasley in his second year, and Smoke in his second year, those those are, are are very valuable pieces to us. You know, we put a lot of emphasis and placed a lot of emphasis uh, in training camp and improving our passing game from the previous year, and, and you know, up to this point, it is it has paid off. It's it's paid dividends. Um, you know, this is a passing league. Uh, you know, you see, you know, Kansas City last year, and they 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 finish it off and and, and win the thing. Uh, you got to be able to throw the football uh, in today's game, and that's something that we really we really focused on hard um, with our players, with with the new pieces that we added. You know, you ha- you get a guy like like Steph. We we know what Cole and, and Smoke can do. <clears throat> you watch you watch Steph on, on Minnesota tape, and you, you know you got a pretty good feel for it, but you really need to see him in person. And the things that he can do well, so we've we've really adjusted and adapted, whether it be him or you know we have um, uh, a couple other rookies that we have, Gabe Davis that that have really stepped up in in, in training camp. We didn't even have you know people call it ten personnel. We weren't coming into the season thinking we were going to play that, and as training camp went on, um, you know he really did a good job and deserved playing time. And I think that that's you know that's been a, a pretty successful personnel group for us. So. You know, you put all those pieces together and you have some consistency with it. You hope that that leads to more points um, in terms of, of not having the fans uh, in the, the audibles and the things like that. And the alerts, it goes both ways. It's, it's good to communicate. You can communicate out there, but, you know, the, the defense can also hear it, too. So you, know, you have to have some dummy calls played in and, and, and different hand signals and, and change those things up on a week to week basis. And you're constantly listening to the television copy to see what, you know, the other teams hearing and do you have to switch it for the next week or do you have to have another, you know, a little disregard the audible so they don't exactly know what's coming. So um, those are the challenges that come up each week. Yeah. And that's uh, thanks for the question, Tony. That's really it's insightful. Thanks, Tony. We also have a, another question from Patty and she says, um, uh, she asked you if you expected Josh to, to ever see the field as well as he does seems to now. Uh, there were people, and obviously Josh has been very polarizing when he came into the league, uh, but I have, and I've, I've observed, and you know, um, he's a completely different quarterback now than he was when he came in just two, two and a half years ago, and, and, uh, I, and he's still getting better. Uh, and I guess her question, uh, t- uh, Patty's question is, um, do you expect bigger things from him? I mean, what more could you expect from a guy like Josh? I mean, last week it was 400 yards and three touchdowns. He ran for one, no interceptions. Pretty special day. Yeah, he, he, he's, he's gotten better, like I said, ever since he stepped in, and that's his mindset. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to give him a, a ceiling. I think he just he comes in, he works hard. He's a, he's a great leader for our football team. Um, you know, his, his job is to lead us down and score points and, and make the right decisions. Um, and he embraces that. Um, again, how we tailor things, this is specifically towards Josh. Um, you know, he's our quarterback, and uh, the quarterback has to feel comfortable in order for the offense to work. Yeah, we've also got a question from M&T Banks Community of Fans, brought us to us by Sharon. She asked if the team chemistry, which it hasn't always been evident uh, for the Buffalo Bills over the past two decades, but now over the past three years, it's really been – part of something that that seems more tangible what's been the biggest factor in fostering that kind of chemistry that even casual fans can see how special it is here in buffalo well i think it starts with the ownership group and terry and kim and, and trickles down to the brand and our general manager and, and sean um you know sean's the guys and, and the guy in front of the team uh, every day um, he has set the culture uh, for this organization and it's our job as assistants and, and people that administration or the organization, wherever that may be, equipment staff, training staff, uh, to follow suit. Um, 
and he set a strong culture. And, it, and culture isn't an easy thing to, to build. It takes time, uh, it takes consistency, and it takes a lot of hard work. And, you know, we're, he's in his fourth year here, and, you know, I'm in my third year here. And uh, it's certainly something that, that we're proud of in terms of establishing a culture um, that he wants for our football team. And yeah, we've got also got some questions for some from some more uh, season ticket members as well. And 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 I, and I remember this because even when I played, everybody goes through tough losses and yeah. everybody takes it for granted. But it's sometimes more difficult for coaches because now you have to go into the locker room and find something positive or a message for your team after a loss, like yesterday's loss. Sure. How do how does your staff, the coaching staff, handle the messaging to the players after a, a loss like yesterday when it was so heartbreaking? Yeah, I think it's important as a coach and as a leader to be consistent and have a consistent message. Uh, I think the worst thing to do in our business is to be up one week and down the next. Uh, I think the, to be level-headed and to explain the things that we did well and to correct the things we didn't do well uh, take accountability for the things that you could have done better for your team and, and each player take accountability for what they could have done better. And as long as you stay consistent with the process uh, that you believe in and, and those guys know that you're consistent with it and you're not up and down, uh, I think that's a mark of, of good leadership. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of those guys, on our staff and, and on our team. Um, you know, certainly it's tough when you lose, you put so much into it, uh, everything you have during the week, um, you know, you do everything you can do to, to put yourself in a good position to win. And, and sometimes that doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, th that's your job as, as a coach and as a player to, you know, figure out why, um, you know, most of these games are going to be tight games in this league. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't want it any other way. It should hurt uh, for all the, the effort and the energy and the focus that you put into it. Um, you should feel some pain uh, when it doesn't, the outcome doesn't come out your way. Well, in a game like yesterday, when you come down to the to the last drive where you guys score a go-ahead touchdown with less than a minute to go, and you've got a quarterback in Josh. And like we, we've talked about him uh, in this Zoom meeting about how gifted he is. Does he present any special challenges or special opportunities or something different about Josh Allen that when you're calling plays, you've got to know during a game or when you're preparing for a game? Um, what is it about Josh Allen makes him – different than other guys to call plays for? Oh, well, he, it's his own unique skill set. Uh, again, every, every quarterback that, that I've ever been around is, is different. Um, and, you know, what you try to do is you try to develop the young ones. Uh, and, and he's certainly been, uh, he's been great to work with, um, you know, having him from his rookie year all the way to where he is now. Uh, he has, you know, some incredible abilities, natural given abilities, whether it be with his legs or, Again, Steve, there's there's, there's things that I know that he likes um, in our offensive package, and then there's certain things that you know he doesn't like. So we don't call those things. We try to develop the things that that he does well, that he prefers, that he feels comfortable with, that he can go out there and execute at a high level under critical situations. And you know that's you know some of those plays that we ran at the end of the game last week were just core you know training camp one on one plays that you know, plays that you know I knew he was very very comfortable with and. He did a nice job of, of going out there and executed all, but the last one was a was a game plan play. So you've got 10 games under your belt, and now you're headed to the bye week to get a little bit of rest. You've had a chance to kind of raise up and certainly scout and see a lot of the teams in the AFC on film. In your opinion, I mean, what are you looking at defensively when you look around the AFC? Who are the defenses that are that seem different and special this year? Oh, it's, it's, it feels like each one, each week is, is the, the next best one you play. Um, they all present unique challenges. Every, everyone is different. You know, they have different personnel matchups and different blitz packages. And, you know, some are game plan teams, which are tough to, to deal with because you don't know exactly what you're going to get. You have to fall back on your rules and do a good job of, of, of picking up the blitz or, you know, defeating whatever coach they want to play. Uh, you know, they all got good players at the team we're about to, to play here in a couple of weeks, got some unbelievable edge rushers and, you know, haven't quite yet got started on them, but, um, you know, it's just, it's, you know, every week is a tough week. In, uh, uh, when you see how much um, your offense has taken it to the next level, and is it still common practice? We've heard, you know, we hear things from commentators like guy, like guys like I used to be, uh, 
do you still, is it common practice to script out a number of plays to start a game to maybe find out a little bit something about what the defense is doing or maybe check them out? And if, if it is common, what is something that would happen that would make you say, wait a minute, I'm going off script. Uh, is that ever happened to you or is that still common practice? Sure. Yeah, no, you, you, you have an idea of things you want to start out with and, and maybe that's to set up plays later down the road, but you know, you never really know exactly how the game is going to start. Um, you know, you might think you're going to, you know, win the toss, the coin toss and get the ball and you're going to start at a certain field position. All of a sudden the, the returners, you know, gets a 40 yard, 50 yard gain. And now you're in a different part of the field that you have scouted that, you know, maybe there's some different tendencies. So I think it's always important to have a beginning, um, some beginning openers that you might want to go with, but you know, you, you have to reserve the right to change those based on, you know, maybe, Maybe you're not going in the wind. Maybe, you know, there's a lot of different things that come up. So just to have, you know, 10 plays and this is what I'm going to call and no matter what, um, that's not really the philosophy that we subscribe to. We, you know, we got to get a feel for, you know, where we're getting the ball. Are you going into the sun? You're not going into the sun, the wind, whatever it may be. Uh, but there are certainly some openers that, you know, we have on our list that we can pick and choose from. I know when you get together a game plan, you look at the defense and you think, well, maybe if we could get some matchups that we like, maybe we'll exploit them. How much thought do you give uh, and when do you give it? Is it during the week or on game day about, listen, I want Steph Diggs to get a bunch of targets this week, or I want Cole Beasley or John Brown, or, you know, how much of that goes into each and every game week and, and how much do you consider whether somebody may not get any targets and somebody may get a ton of them or vice versa, you know, how much thought goes into that? Or is it strictly, or are you just looking at X's and O's on a page and, and going with your best matchup? Yeah, I think that, I think there, there's a little bit of both. I think you're, you're developing a plan that you see fit in terms of the, the plays that you want run. And then you're putting those players in, in specific positions. Um, again, it's, it's hard to really determine where the ball is going to go unless, you know, maybe you're calling a screen and that's a one man play, but, you know, most of the plays we have have, you know, whether it's three, four or five guys out with progressions and based on the coverage that we're getting um, really dictates, you know, to Josh where where he needs to go with the football um, to sit there and force a ball to a particular player. You know, that, that's not really what we subscribe to. It's, you know, let's let's go out. Let's make sure we're in the right spot. And then, you know, wherever it may be um, takes us, whether it's zone coverage, if it's man, man's a little bit different, Steve, in the fact that you know, you, you know, you let the matchups dictate and, you know, you might like a particular receiver versus a DB this week, or you might get a, a, a man zone indicator by putting a tight end outside, whatever, to let Josh say, okay, I know it's this, this is where I'm going. And that eliminates some of the decision process uh, versus the zone stuff. One last question before we let you go, Brian, uh, aside from your family, maybe your parents, or your grandparents or your brothers, or I, I don't even, you know, your large family or whatever, your fa particularly here in Buffalo, but as far as your professional coaching career sure. and the guys you have worked with and worked under, who had the most effect on your life as a, as a coach that allowed you to get, you know, to this level of the NFL and this level of your prof profession, who would you, who'd you get the most out of? Well, you know, I was, I was fortunate to, to, to play for some some really good uh, high school coaches and Jerry Smith and John Shabetta um, that that really you know they taught me about football but they taught me a lot more about football uh, being a good man and, and being a good person um, you know those those were really the two guys that that I hold dear to my heart um, professionally speaking obviously I worked for, for Bill Belichick for 11 years um, and, and learned you know a great deal from him um, and I worked for Saban for for four years so. Um, there's been a lot of people along the way that that I've learned from. It's not just those head coaches; those are the guys I've worked for the longest. Um, you know, what, what's important to me is to is to try to be myself and and take bits and pieces that I've learned from, but but really be the man that that I know I can be and uh, be the leader that I can be for this team. Brian, I know it's a busy time for you. I know it's a bye week, so we appreciate you taking a minute to be with us. Thanks for joining us tonight on this speaker series presented by presented by M and T Bank. Big thanks to you. Uh, for for being here tonight, and we wish every, you and the rest of the team luck in the second half of the season, last six games of the regular season. Hopefully, about three or four games into the postseason as well. Thanks, man. Good Thanks, luck. Steve. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tony.